understanding reaction mechanisms allows us to make predictions about the behavior of substrates under a given set of reaction conditions. Most often, we're interested in making a relative comparison between a substrate that we've observed directly and one that we plan to work with in the future. How much product should we expect to form relative to our reference reaction? How rapid should we expect the reaction to be relative to the reference? Answering these questions demands an understanding of the electronic and steric properties of the intermediates and transition states of a mechanism. In this webcast, we'll develop a general process for drawing transition states of elementary steps based on given intermediates and curved arrows. You're probably familiar with the idea that reactions typically proceed via stable intermediates in the absence of input energy, such as heat or light. We expect reactions that proceed via stable intermediates to yield more product than those that do not. Put another way, reactions that proceed through stable intermediates are more thermodynamically favorable than those that do not, and when making predictions about the relative extent of two related reactions, we appeal to the stability of intermediates and products. In the example you see here, we should expect elimination B to proceed to a greater extent than elimination A, because B results in the formation of a stable conjugated system, while A does not. Ultimately, this analysis of reaction extent is based on the stability of intermediates and products, compounds with finite lifetime. What about reaction speed? From first principles, there's no connection between reaction speed and the stability of intermediates. This may come as a surprise to you, but recognize that the stability of a product that follows a transition state is not necessarily related to the structure of that transition state, although they are often related in practice. In fact, reaction speed has everything to do with the stability of transition states, the energy maxima between intermediates. This is because the rate of a step is related to its activation energy, which is a function of the stability of the transition state, assuming that the two reactants are of similar energy. To compare the relative rates of two elementary steps in a general way, we must compare the stability of their respective transition states, not the stability of their reactants or products. Transition states do not have finite lifetime and cannot be observed directly. This fact presents an important problem. How can we draw a structure that we can't see? The solution to this conundrum involves recognizing that the transition state is between the reactants and products with respect to reaction coordinate. The transition state possesses characteristics of both the reactants and products, including partial bonds where bonds are being made or broken, geometries that are intermediate between the reactants and products, and partial charges where charges are changing. Let's develop some general principles for drawing transition states now and apply these to a specific example. Where a bond is breaking as an elementary step proceeds, we can imagine the distance between the two atoms lengthening. Thus, in the transition state, we would draw these two atoms at a larger distance than they are in the reactant, but still partially connected through a dotted bond. When a bond is forming, we can imagine the opposite scenario. We draw the atoms at a closer distance than they are in the reactant, and connected through a dotted bond that gets shorter as the step proceeds. These same ideas hold true when double and triple bonds are forming and breaking, but we indicate as partial only the bond forming or breaking, that is, the pi bond. Many elementary steps involve geometry and hybridization changes at one or more atoms. In these cases, we think of the transition state hybridization as intermediate between the hybridization of the reactants and that of the products. For instance, in the transition state for the first step of SN1 substitution, we depict the electrophilic carbon atom as partially, but not completely, flattened. This suggests a hybridization state between sp3 and sp2. What about partial charges? Anywhere where charge is changing as an elementary step proceeds, we depict partial charges on the atoms. This principle includes both neutral atoms that become charged and charged atoms that become neutral as the step proceeds. In a general sense, we can think of atomic charges of reactants and products as either plus one, zero, or minus one, while the charges in transition states have values between plus and minus one. 
To return to the example of the first step of SN1, the leaving group possesses a negative charge in the products, and the electrophilic carbon possesses a positive charge. In the transition state for the step, there's partial positive charge on the carbon atom and partial negative charge on the leaving group to indicate the development of charge on these atoms as the step proceeds. The graph you see here tracks the amount of charge on each atom as a function of the progress of the step. We can see that there's the continuous development of charge on the atoms as the step proceeds. Like intermediates, we can reason about the stability of transition states using ideas like electronegativity, charge delocalization, steric hindrance, hybridization, and others. However, it's important to remember that these ideas apply to the kinetics or speed of a reaction, not necessarily to how far the reaction proceeds or its extent. Hopefully this webcast demonstrated to you that given reactants and curved arrows for an elementary step, we can easily draw a transition state that depicts partially made and broken bonds and partial charges. Try drawing transition states for some of the elementary steps that you see depicted here.